let's jump into the word, shall we? Yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> if you've ever tried to apply for a loan to buy a house or a car or a goldfish or gas, <laughs> it's like apply for a loan to fill your tank, um, <laughs> they, they, they require a lot from you, don't they? A like social security number, um, you know, your, your employment verification, your pay stub, how long you work there, uh, if you rent, if you own, how long have you lived there, how much do you pay in rent, or how much do you pay, you know, uh, other loans that you have. They ask so many questions, right? So judgmental. Shouldn't be doing that, right? No. Uh, they, have, they, have the, they have the right to, don't they? And, and, and it's valid for them to be able to do that because they want to make sure that if they're giving you $8,000 or $10,000 that you can pay it back, that you're good for it. If you were going to loan someone money, five grand, 10 grand, 20 grand, whatever, you also would want to verify if this person is good for it. Many of you, you uh, when the offering baskets goes around, you don't really put your tithes or offering in. I've been watching you. <laughs> I'm joking. <clears throat> I don't, but someone else does. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm just meddling now. But, but, but you, don't, you don't tie to the church because you want to make sure that the money is going to the right place. And nothing wrong with that. Good for you. It's good. Take your time. But, but know that you also need to trust God because sometimes people can have all the right things and still be crooks. What I'm trying to get at is you would want to do a lot of your verification, which is what the title for this morning's message is, verified. You'll do a lot of your verification before you put... $100, $1,000, $10,000 into something. How much more should you then verify when someone tells you that they can be trusted with your life? Is your, is your life not as valuable as $10,000? I mean, if someone says, hey, trust me with your life, you definitely want to verify the claims. Of that person. Now, even more when that person says, uh, trust me with eternity. <laughs> we cannot be casual about this. You cannot afford to say, all roads would lead to heaven. You have to verify its claims. Then this is extremely important. I would think that this should cause you to put everything else on hold to say, wait a minute, man. If I'm going to trust eternity into something I have got to really validate the claims of what is being brought before me of saying, trust me with this. Now, now, if you're tracking with me, it's beautiful because there's no other worldview that I know of that has the claims that Christianity claims and also can be verified the way Christianity can. Because here you have a man who walks the earth, and he says, I am God, and yet can be verified. It's fascinating. Today, around the world, there are people who stand behind pulpits and preach, but do not themselves believe the claims of Jesus because he's not been verified to them. There are people who stand in college seminaries and teach theology but don't believe the claims of Yeshua, of Jesus, because his claims have not been verified. And they are the people that's raising up the next generation. And I want to talk to a church that's called the Living Church, and I want to make sure that the claims of Yeshua, the claims of Jesus, have been verified, and that you have come to a place of belief, of knowing clearly who Jesus is, and rejoicing in what he said he came to do, and what he is going to do. Jesus makes a statement that begins to spiral into a mess. The statement is this. It's found in John chapter 8, verse 12. We spoke about this last week. Let me recap it for you. Once again, Jesus spoke to them saying, this is John chapter 8, verse 12. Once again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. If you were here last week, that was point number one. That was the claim that Jesus makes. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, that's the call, point number two, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's point number three, the condition of every believer. We saw his claim, we saw his call, and we see the condition. Now, 
in our modern day world, now I'm from India, I don't know if you can tell, and in India, we have a very different worldview when it comes to God. In fact, we have gods, we have plural. In fact, we say anybody can be a God. It's kind of like Mormonism, really, okay? Mormonism, Hinduism for white people, okay? I don't care, fire me, big deal. It's daylight savings, I get to say what I want. Where I come from, we don't have, we have reverence for gods, for deity, but we, this kind of saying, I am the light of the world, it's a common saying. Sri Sri Ravi Shankar will say that. I mean, there was a guru that the Beatles traveled to India because he said he was a light. Where is he now? Candle in the wind. Right? Gone. So something like this, when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, please listen to me. I really want to, I want to like scratch your curiosity. This for a person living in the North End just sounds like some new age mumbo jumbo. But to the people that Jesus is talking to, this was a claim unlike any other. This was him saying that he is God. That he is the great I am. That he is the pillar of fire that led their forefathers through the wilderness. That he is the creator of heaven and earth. He's not saying I'm just another new age guru. And if we are believers who say that our hope is set on Jesus, he is our living hope, you need to take and pay close attention to his claims. And you need to verify what he said to people plainly. And then challenge them to verify the claims. Now, there are two ways you can challenge a claim. One, you can ask to understand, which most of our children don't do. Or you can ask to argue. There's a fair chance that you say that you're a Christian, that you're a believer, but not once have you asked to understand what it means when Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the savior of the world. I am the true light that shines in the darkness. If anyone follows me, he will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It's possible that you've not had a curiosity, a joy, a relentless pursuit of finding out, am I walking in darkness or am I walking in light? And it's quite possible that that's why your Christianity feels so shallow and dead and you're able to sleep in when the government says, turn your clocks ahead. And then your whole life is just dozing off. As Keith Green says, you're asleep in the light. What I love about Jesus is that being God, he doesn't say, shut your mouth, I'm God. Who are you to find out who I am? Instead, he becomes flesh. He walks the earth. And he says, verify. Ver verify your claims. Everything that I'm telling you, you can... Thomas, put your hand in my hand. Put your hand in my side. Ghosts don't have flesh and bones. Give me some fish, let me eat. We have a God who loves to be verified by his creation. We have a God who says, I am word, I still communicate. We have a God who says, it's good for you that I go because then I'm going to send you the Holy Ghost and he's been with you, but he'll be in you and he will teach you all things that I've been telling you. He will bring to your memory the things that I've, I've, I've told you and his spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you are children of God. I wish I had a church that was full of children of God whose spirit is bearing witness with his spirit that you are born again. It's beautiful that you have a God who doesn't walk you through this life with uncertainty. I was riding one of my old motorcycles in the dark last night, and man, I was like, I got to be careful because it's so dim and it's so dark and there's no street lights in this place where I was riding. And my wife said, yeah, it's an old bike, huh? I said, yeah, yeah, it's an old bike. And it made me think of people who said that they've been Christians for 30, 40 years. You're walking in old light? You're walking in a dim bulb? Your bulb is your own righteousness, your own works, because you were saved at the Billy Graham crusade. You think you're going to cut the line to heaven? Church, I love you. 
but you need to verify the claims of Yeshua. So these people, instead of asking to understand, what they're going to do is they're going to ask to, to, to justify their righteousness, and they're going to try to discredit the claims of Jesus. Now, if you're with me so far, good for you. But you need to know that when Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, light, in essence, does not need to defend itself. Right? Because light in being light is a witness that it's a light. Light, prove to me that you are light. <laughs> Stupidity. How do I know you're not darkness? But Okay, fine. You can get into that. You could say, Joel, you're taking it too literally. Okay, track with me again. Here's John the baptizer in front of thousands of people, Pharisees and sinners and Jews and even many Gentiles over there too. He points to Jesus and he says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus is there in John chapter 8. He's going to say, which of you convicts me of sin? And the silence. So even if you say, I'm being, I'm being quite literal when I talk about light, but even if we talk more figuratively, he says, I'm the light of the world, but they're not going to come in submission and surrender and saying, truly, there's something very different about you. Like Nicodemus, who says, no one could do the works that you're doing unless he was from above. But they begin to ask Jesus to validate his claims about being light. So although God appreciates you wanting to validate, there's also an attitude in which we got to come to understand in humility, to surrender, to grow even more intimate with Jesus, which is the mission of our church. So without further ado, there are three things I want to point out in the next seven verses. We're going to be talking about how Jesus validates his claims of him being the light of the world by bringing to the surface, by bringing to the light, so to speak, his divine origin and deity, his judgment against humanity, and the outcome of this stupidity. Sorry, daylight savings. Okay, I couldn't use a different word. I'm just going to blame that for everything, like how politicians are blaming Russia for everything. Okay, daylight savings, baby. Here we go. But the outcome of this stupidity, I was going to use the outcome of the futility, but I don't use that word in my day-to-day -day language. So in, in an effort to be authentic and simple, we'll talk about his divine origin and deity, his judgment against humanity, and the outcome of this stupidity in discrediting the light of the world. So let's look at number one, his divine origin and deity. This is what they did not know. So if you have your Bibles, John chapter 8, we're going to be picking up from verse 12, and we'll go down to verse 20, and I'm going to try and keep it within my time limit this, this Sunday. Now, those that have not come to a place of being spiritually transformed, okay, I told you this earlier, there's a, there's a possibility that your spiritual life is dead because you've not come to a place of being amazed at the reality of who Jesus is at the fact of who Jesus is and who he's said to be. The superiority of Jesus is not just that, you know, he was, he was fully God. The superiority of Jesus is also that he was fully man. One minute he's weeping, and the next minute he's saying, Lazarus, come forth, and a dead man's walking. One minute he's tired and he's hungry, the next minute he's walking on water. The uniqueness about Jesus is, is humanity and his deity. And if you lack the supernatural move of God in your life, it's quite possible that you're chasing after so many other things, but forgetting that Jesus was fully man and fully God, and being fully man, he identifies with exactly where you are. For we have a high priest who was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And it makes him very unique. So let's look at this. Jesus, verse 12, John chapter 8. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This sparks this conversation that's going to go into crazy different places. Verse 13. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Okay. John chapter 8 is a very confusing chapter. Okay. Because it seems like Jesus is all over the place with his answers. They're asking him a question or they're making an accusation and it seems like what he's answering is not really the accusation that they're bringing but he's saying something completely different. Now you need to understand that whenever you come across passages like this by Jesus talking to these Pharisees, we have an idea, we have a tone in our head when we read it. 
And we think that Jesus is really using such divine, you know, knowledge and wisdom to corner them and trying to get them to like, you know, like arm wrestle them and back them into a corner. It's not what he's doing. He's being extremely gracious. He's being extremely patient and loving. And his goal, see, if Jesus wanted them to be cornered, he could have done that. He's God. If, if Jesus wanted to like checkmate, you're done, you're out, tear them down with his words, he could have done that. The God that we worship is so beautiful, man, that he, like a master chess player, he's orchestrating this conversation and he's going to get them to ask questions so that he can teach them good, sound theology that their rabbis have not taught them, okay? So when he says, I am the light of the world, and what they are coming up with is they're saying, you're bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true, okay? It seems like, what are they saying? Now, if Jesus, please track with me, I know it's daylight savings. If Jesus brought a woman caught in adultery, we saw that last week, right? If Jesus brought a woman caught in adultery and said, should we kill her? Because the law of Moses, then they have the right to say, hey, you need witnesses. Because it says in Deuteronomy chapter 17, this is what Moses writes. Deuteronomy 17 verse 6, on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person should not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Is Jesus bringing anybody to be killed? You're tracking with me, right? He's not. You're bearing witness to yourself. Now, this happens all the time, even till today, does it not? Where they take something that Jesus said, misquote him, right? Use some other part of scripture against him and say, his claims are not valid. Now, if you are sitting here and you've tried to communicate with people and they've misrepresented the Bible and misquoted the Bible and you're shocked that preachers would do that, that prosperity gospel people will do that, people who are going around like fake healing will do that, don't be surprised because these clowns did it to Jesus at his face using his own words. That's the world we're living in. Now, it's quite possible that what they're doing is they're quoting what he said in John chapter 5. Because Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 31, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. So once again, it's possible that they're again taking something that he said and said, hey, you remember you said, if you bear witness about yourself, it's not true. And if you remember John chapter 5, Jesus brings John the baptizer. He says, he was a witness. In fact, I preached a whole sermon on that. I said, he was the most recent witness, John the baptizer. And then he says, look at my miracles, which is the most relevant witness, witness, Indian accent kicking in. And then he brings a father and he says, the most revered witness. I think the message is called, get past yourself and get to God. It's on the app. Listen to it, John chapter 5. So Jesus already brought forth his witnesses about his claims. And here they're saying, you're bearing witness over yourself, saying that you're the light of the world. It's not true, because nobody else bears witness. Look at Jesus, verse 14. Jesus answered, that's not what I'm doing, but even if I do bear witness, even if I do bear witness, which says, that's not what I'm doing, man. But even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is? Church, know this. I mean, this is self, man. I can shut the Bible down and you can go home and you can live under this truth. It's beautiful. God's word is true. Oh my gosh. Listen, there are people who lied about God's word. There are people that have distorted God's word. There are people that have demeaned God's word. There are people that have gone against God's word. There are billion people who will say, no, Jesus never said that he is God, but it does not change the fact that God's word is true. Let every man be a liar, but let God be true. It doesn't change the fact that God's word is true. Man, what a beautiful thing for you to rest under in a world full of lies. Turn on your phone, it's full of lies. Turn on your TV, it's full of lies. And many times you go listen to preachers, it's full of lies. Where do we go? Praise God, I get to go to God's word, which is true. And in a few weeks, we're going to see how this truth will set you free, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Jesus says, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. And now he's going to talk about his origin and his destiny. We'll get to it. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where you've come from or where you're going. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, okay, okay. This needs to give you goosebumps, okay? Because there's no person in the existence of the universe that can make this claim. Buddha did not know how he was going to die. Sri Sri Ravi Shankar did not know how he was going to die. 
all these pastors, evangelists, popes, theologians have no idea how they're going to die. Their divine destiny is not in their hands. There's only one person in the existence of the world that was able to stand boldly and say, I know where I've come from. I know where I'm going. I know my divine origin. I know my divine purpose. And I know my divine destiny. And that's why it's such a beautiful thing if you're a believer to say, Jesus Christ, he is my living hope. You know, my grandma used to sing this a lot. You know, I know who holds tomorrow. I do not know what holds tomorrow, but I know who holds tomorrow. There was only one person who was able to say this. Why, why, why is it so important for us to make a whole point about this? Why is it so important for me to stand up over here and to drill this into you, believer, to know the valid claims of Jesus that he was divine in origin, divine in his purpose, divine in his destiny? Because the whole gospel of John is dedicated for you and me thousands of years later to be able to read and to say, wow, in him was life. And this life was the light of men. John will write in John chapter 20 when he says, I'm writing this so that you will believe. And in believing in his name, you will have life in his name. He wants you to recognize the valid claims of Jesus. How many people are there who say that they're believers but do not know Jesus? They say they're Christians, but they do not know the Christ that the Bible talks about. We know some sort of denominational rules. We have some sort of racial conduct that we have. We have some sort of national pride, but we do not know Jesus. What kind of Christianity is this? He was divine in his origin, divine in his purpose, divine in his destiny. Let me give you some scripture about this, how Jesus himself talks about this. In John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Nicodemus! You studied scripture. You're the teacher of Israel. I'm talking to you about what's been verified, man. And you're running a background check on me? You come to me at night and you say, clearly no one can do the things that you're doing unless he was sent from above. And yet you do not believe my testimony? What's it going to take for you to finally believe that I'm divine in my origin, divine in my purpose, divine in my destiny? In John chapter 7, there's a buzz around the crowd. And this is what the crowd is talking about. They say, we know where this man comes from. But when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. You remember how we spoke about the oida and the gnosko, the two different kinds of knowing with this. And so Jesus, his reply to them when he's teaching the temple, he says, you know me? Yeah? You think you do? And you know where I'm coming from, do you? But I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. Jesus knew his origin, he knew his destiny, and he knew his purpose. Now, if I were God, I'm not. I'm just brown. In Idaho. Pretty daring, man. No, I'm kidding. I'm just saying that to keep the Californians away, okay? okay. Don't come here. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Seriously, jacked up trucks will run prayers off the road. Okay? I'm kidding. True story. <laughs> oh. um, if I were God and I knew where I come from, where angels prostrate fall at my presence, if I was God and I said, let there be light, and there was light and I had that power at my use. I would not stand in front of hypocrites, self-righteous losers and say, verify my claims. And I will stand here and patiently talk to you so much so that you are going to want to kill me. And John chapter 8 ends with Jesus hiding in the temple. Jesus hiding in the temple. God hiding in the temple because they're looking to kill him. This is exactly why the Muslims, the atheists, and people around the world don't believe and don't want to ascribe reverence to Jesus because they see him as being weak. He runs and he hides. And moreover, look at this. It's time for Jesus. He's getting close to the cross. He's getting ready to be betrayed and crucified. And there are some devout Greeks that come to the disciples and say, hey, we want to see Jesus. And Jesus gets up and he preaches this beautiful message. John chapter 12 is fantastic, and I can't wait to get to it. 
He talks about unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies. But in verse 27, Jesus gets up and he says, now is my soul troubled. Now is my soul troubled? I'm talking about a God who's divine in origin, divine in his purpose, and divine in his destiny. And he's saying his soul is troubled? What kind of a God is this? What kind of a God is this who cries and weeps and who feels pain and who feels hungry? What kind of a God is this? Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. And then he says, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I've glorified it and I will glorify it again. Why did Jesus have to put himself through this kind of torture? Why did he have to put himself to be demeaned like this? Why did he have to put himself to be made nothing? Isaiah talks about he's beaten beyond recognition. Why? So they can be verified by you and me 2,000 years later. And say, wow, he is truly the Lamb of God. And on him, all the sins of the world were spread. So you can verify. So you could say he was tempted in every way and yet without sin. And that's why there's an empty grave because death could not hold him down. Man, he took all my sin on himself. And that's why I want to celebrate the resurrection. And that's why on the Lord's day, I want to come and sing, you are my living hope. Why did he have to go through such degrading torment and torture? Not just at the cross, but at the hands of these religious folks. So you and I, 2,000 years later, could be like, wow, what a savior. Like really, he put himself out. I mean, in the priest's hands, like a, like a lamb that they would check to see if there was any blemish. He truly was a perfect Passover lamb. John chapter 13, the very next one, we once again see Jesus knowing fully his divine origin, his divine purpose, and his divine destiny. John chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that's his purpose, and that he had come from God, that's his origin, and was going back to God, that's his destiny. He rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist, and what does he do? washes the disciples' feet. Are you blown away at the God that you and I worship? Are you amazed at his humility? Are you, are you amazed at how great he is and yet how he makes himself nothing? Because that's what true greatness is, isn't it? Because in that same chapter, he will say, listen, me being your teacher and your master, you call me that and it's right. And I have done this. Now you go do Likewise. Because true greatness does not need to parade its greatness, man. True greatness can humble itself and become nothing and still be great. Jesus knew exactly who he was. And he opens himself up to be verified. Truth is never frightened to be questioned. Light is never frightened to be validated or to be, to be examined. If you're sitting over here and you feel like, I've been a Christian all my life. But I've never really been amazed at the reality of who Jesus is. I've never really been amazed at the truth, the fact of who Jesus is. Maybe, maybe you're here. You've been a Christian for 20, 30 years, but you've never, your heart's never skipped a beat, jumped for joy at how amazing, how big, how large the awesomeness of Jesus is. Uh, don't, 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 don't beat yourself up too much. Because even the disciples didn't get it right away. But if the Holy Spirit is causing you to make much of Jesus this morning, don't fight it. Philip, in John chapter 14, he tells Jesus, says, Lord, show us the Father, and it'll be enough for us. And you can hear almost sorrow in Jesus' voice. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Really, man? You see me walk on water. Took a little boy's lunch and fed thousands and thousands of people. Dead man walking. And you say, show me the Father. Have I been with you this long and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me, Philip, has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, do not, I, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And then he says, Philip, if that's too much for you to digest, man, at least believe on the account of the works themselves. If that's too much for your theology, 
And I want to tell you this morning, if it's too much for you to be able to pack that Jesus is God, at least look at his works. And I would say look at his works of him being brutally murdered on that cross and then stuffed into a tomb. And then on the third day, the tombstone rolls away because death could not hold him down. There was an empty tomb. At least for that sake, would your heart leap for joy and say, and his word that he says is true says that he died for me so that my sin was put in that tomb and out comes righteousness that is mine today? At least on that account, you have to pay a little closer attention and say, maybe I can't do this life on my own. Maybe I need to take my righteousness, which is sinful, and dump it in that tomb. And then embrace all that Jesus has for me and walk out. And isn't that what the Bible says? That the same power that raised Yeshua from the grave now lives in who? That lives in who? That lives in who? It's got to live in a believer's life. But how will you walk in power and authority if you've not validated the claims of Jesus? You know, man, when you go into this world, there's going to be battles that you got to fight, that your wisdom, your intellect, your experience, your righteousness, your muscles, how much you can bench press is not going to mean a thing. There's going to be battles that you cannot even see. I'm not talking about a virus. There's going to be darkness that can be felt. And if this is the living church, I want to make sure that we have the light of life. And I want to make sure that we're familiar with the light of life. I want to make sure that we've validated its claims so we know without a certain, without a shadow of a doubt, that when darkness comes in like a flood, that he will raise a standard by his blood, and that you can walk in the power and the authority that his word, which is true, says that we can walk in. Are you ready for that, church? Let me quickly move on, because if you don't understand the importance of his claims of deity, his judgment against humanity will seem like hate speech to you. People walk out of the church because they do not really understand who Jesus is. They don't see that he is deity, that he's God, that he's, he's the creator of heaven and earth. He has all the right to judge. Number two, his judgment against humanity. Now, um, really quick, <clears throat> many people who walk away from God, any relationship from God, people that walk away from any sort of an authority relationship, okay, not just with God, any relationship, the reason why they walk away from authority is because they want to be an authority, okay? So take that same idea and put it into a religion or into a relationship with God. You walk away from having God as an authority because you want to be God. And why do people want to be God? Why is it that people don't want to be under the authority of God, but they say, I want to be God? It's because they don't like his rules, they don't like his laws. They don't like his standards. So in essence, what they're saying is, let me write the laws for my own life. Let me write my morality for my life. In the world, that is motivational speech. Good for you, man. Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. Well, your way will take you, take you straight to hell. Okay? We've got to walk in the ways of God. Why is that? If you were your own creator, if you were the one that brought yourself into existence, you have all the right to make your own rules and laws. You're accountable to yourself. But you are a created being. You have a creator. And so we're answerable to the creator then. And so we know that he created you for a purpose. He created you for a, with a destiny in mind. He created you at a time, so you have your origin, you have your destiny, you have your purpose. So you writing your rules is now contradicting who you because you're saying, I want to be the creator. Now, you and I know that when we write our own moral laws, it's absolute stupidity. Right? We cannot be our own moral raw law writers. Why is that? Because our destiny is not in our hand. 
right? We, you do not decide when you want to be born. You cannot decide when you want to die. So you cannot really write the laws for your life. You have to submit to the moral lawgiver, the creator, the he- creator of heaven and earth, and the creator who created you. Now, if we realize that we cannot write our own laws, how absurd and how stupid is it for us to turn and to say, I'm going to judge God. I'm going to validate God. See what I'm saying? It seems almost foolish. I am unable to even govern my own life. And I now want to turn and tell God how he should govern the earth. And I want to put God on the stand and say, how dare you kill 3,000 children? But when you don't recognize the awesomeness of God, when you don't recognize that God is God, in, in our world today, we've lost the reverence for God, okay? And I think God is going to bring it back very, very, very soon. And every time I see posts about people laughing about those who pray, and I'm like, man, you talk to someone who's been on the edge of their life, and you watch, yeah, they're going to pray. Because we all know God's put eternity in the heart of man. We all know that there's more to life than just what you're doing today. There is an eternity. But if you don't understand the origin, the purpose, and the destiny of Yeshua, of Jesus, the Messiah, his judgment against humanity, the laws that he's written for you, will be absolutely absurd to you. And it's going to look like hate speech. Jesus makes a statement, and it's brilliant in this context because, in essence, what he's going to show is that light cannot be judged by those who are blind. We pretty much are blind people. We cannot even see anything in our own lives. We need his light to make sense in our life. And we're going to turn and say, okay, I'm going to call you to the stand. Look at John chapter 8, verse 15. Jesus says, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Man, there are about 14 amazing one-liners in John chapter 8, okay? I marked about 14. I'm sure there's more, so there's going to be a lot of rabbit trails. But this is one of them. This, I think, needs some elaboration. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. I'm going to go through this quickly, though. Let's take the last part in just a few minutes. But let's look at that first part. You judge according to the flesh. You see, Jesus came into the world not to judge the world. There is a time of judgment coming. John chapter 3, verse 17. I did not come in the world to condemn the world, but I came to save you from your condemnation. We're already judged. And he came to save us from his divine judgment that is coming. There's a beautiful season of grace, isn't it? That he's given us a time to repent, to stop pulling him on the stand and to surrender to him and to live according to his ways. But we have fallen into the sin of judging him according to the flesh. This is how Paul puts it. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ According to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. What is he saying? He's saying that at one point, listen to me now, please. At one point, you looked at God as just a man. Jesus was just a man. We regarded him as a flesh. So, you and I have been there. You sin, you fail, and you turn, you wonder. Like, I'm sure Jesus would have done that. He just got away with it. You may, hey, come on, man, don't leave me hanging. Okay? I'm sure he said a lie here or there, but he just got away with it. Uh, I'm sure you saw, saw, saw some girl with lust. How can he not? Come on, everybody goes through that. I'm sure he did. We judge him according to the flesh. But no more. He says, but no more. We judge no one, he says. We, we shouldn't judge anybody according to the flesh. And later on, if you can't read, he says, we've all made new creations in him. We've made new in him. We judge him according to the flesh, but no more. What's happening is, here are these religious people, listen to me, they're judging him according to their flesh, according to their standards. You didn't wash your hand before you eat, you're going to hell. You're a sinner. You eat, you're hanging out with prostitutes and drunkards. You are a sinner too. You're, you're a Samaritan. We're going to see that next. My racist slurs over there. You're a demon person and have a Samaritan. They're judging according to the flesh. And Jesus says, you judge according to the flesh. I don't judge that way. Thank God that Jesus did not come and judge the, judge the world in the flesh, even though he came in the flesh. But there is a judgment coming. It says in John chapter 5, verse 27, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. There is a day of judgment coming, and he will judge the living and the dead. But praise God that he doesn't judge according to the flesh. 
So then how does he judge? John, back to John chapter 8, verse 16. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. Once again, his words are true. His judgment is true. How can he say that his judgment is true? For or because it is not I alone who judge. Listen to me now. I'm not judging in my flesh as a Jewish man. Not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. I am seeing what you don't see. You ready for something? You ready? Okay. This might help you understand a little bit more of John chapter 8, okay? And just religion in general. Self-righteousness will teach you to judge according to works. Self-righteousness will teach you to judge according to works. Look at that girl. See what she's wearing. Look at that guy. See how, see how he's speaking. Look at that person. How, what she's got, whatever. You know, music listens to where the person lives, whatever. Self-righteousness will judge according to works. Hypocrisy will teach you to, you know, make your intentions look good. Okay? So you have self-righteousness judging works and hypocrisy saying, I have good intentions. I brought the woman caught in adultery. Hypocrisy. Oh, but I have good, we need to keep the law of Moses. Law of Moses says we got to stone her and kill her for the hypocrisy. So I just described majority of churches and Christians right now. Okay? Self-righteousness. They'll kick you out of church because you look different. Hypocrisy. Oh, no, but I had good intentions. The ends will justify the means. Get out of here. No. It doesn't work that way. Now, Jesus shows up on the scene, and boy, he does something completely different from these two because this is all they know. Listen to me. If you don't know Jesus, this is all you know. Either it's self-righteousness or it's hypocrisy. You're hopping, skipping, and jumping like a ping-pong table back and forth and you're tired. <laughs> Okay, self-righteousness, hypocrisy. Today I think I'm going to be a hypocrite. Today I'm going to be self-righteous. Jesus shows up and he says, I don't judge according to that. So what does he judge by? Wow. He doesn't look at your works. He doesn't look at your intentions. Are you ready for this? He looks at your destiny. He looks at your destiny and he says, I did not create you for hell. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to enter into the world and I know where I've come from. I know what my purpose is. I know where I'm going. Now you need to know. And judgment is coming, but now is the time of grace. So you now recognize your origin. You're created. You got to recognize your destiny. You're going towards hell. But I am going to die in your place, and I'm going to give you purpose. And if you will follow me, I am the light of the world. You will not walk in darkness. You don't need to hop from your works to your hypocrisy, come to me. I know what your heart is beating for. I know what you're trying to impress. I know who you're trying to live for. And I know your works don't line up to religious folks. You're too broken to say amen to that. And I, I hear you, man. I feel your pain. And you're too shameful because you're sick and tired of being a hypocrite. And I hear you. Now, there was the cream of the crop who was sick and tired of playing these two games. And they pretty much stuck up the middle finger and they walked out of religion. I said, I don't want that. I can't live up to your nasty standards. The apostle Peter will say, a standard that even our forefathers couldn't carry. A burden, a load. That's, that's, not, that's not what church is supposed to be like, folks. Jesus says, come to me all who are weary, not to put weights on your shoulders. He says, come to me all of you. I will give you rest. Come and learn from me, for I'm humble and gentle at heart. That's not what church is supposed to be like. And the people have walked away, and these, listen to me, were prostitutes. These were men who were hungry for money. They said, you know what, man? I'm just going to go find joy somewhere else. And what do you know? That Jesus wears a badge of honor when they accuse him of saying that he's a friend of sinners. He's like, let, let me put that in my bio and my Instagram. Friend of sinners. And for the hypocrites and for the religious folks, they didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to them. They couldn't comprehend it. Because they're judging according to the flesh. 
And Jesus says, I judge no one. And even if I do judge, my judgment is true for it's not I alone who judge in the flesh, but my Father also judges. I see not the actions, not the behavior, not the flesh, not the color, not the gender, not your past. I'm looking at the destiny that I created you for. And I've come in the world with tears in my eyes to shed my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Mark chapter 2, verse 16, and the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, they don't have the guts to talk to Jesus, they're talking to the disciples. They're processing with the disciples. Friggin' hypocrites. Why does he eat with the tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, he went to them, he's like, hey, you want to know why I'm eating with them? Those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, they need a doctor, man. And I came to call the righteous, not to call the righteous, but the sinners. I've not come to those who feel like they can pay off the debt that they owe. I've come to take care of the debt of those who are bankrupt. I've come to verify their background, check, and to pass it. I've come to delete their debt completely. That's who I came for. You feel like you got your debt under control? I didn't come for you. I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not a collection agency. I'm not come to say, good job, you've been paying your tithes and you've been paying your bills on time. I didn't come for that. I came for those who are weeping and crying and mourning and sad, ripping the clothes saying, how can I ever get out of this? And he says, I'm here. I know my origin. I know my purpose. I know my destiny. And I've come here to reveal your origin your purpose, and your destiny. And if you don't get that, you will look at my judgment that's coming and you'll think that I'm a hater. But when you see who I am, you will jump for joy at my judgment because you will know that anyone who's come into the light has passed from death into life, has passed from judgment into life. And I get goosebumps thinking about this. Um, in Luke chapter 7, there's a, gosh, man, you know, our vision for our church is that our intimacy with Christ uh, that's all I care about, man. I don't care if you learn Greek or Hebrew and you memorize the whole Bible or you read a Bible, you know, 15 times in the entire year. I really don't care. If you don't have love for Jesus, man, you don't belong over here. Or at least if you're not wanting to grow in love for Jesus, this is not the church for you. If you're looking for a nice youth program, a good worship team, this is not the church for you, man. This is a church where we are devoted and dedicated to growing deeply in love with Jesus. Because you know what? I come from a place where we have not had food or water and electricity and all we had was Jesus and he was more than enough. I had a broken guitar that made my fingers bleed when I led worship, and I didn't care. We sang the same song every day, but it was a new song, a joyful noise to him every day. And all we had was love for Jesus, and that's enough, I'm telling you, man. You might not have money to keep the lights on in your house, but if you have love for Jesus, that's enough. That's all I care about in this church, that we grow in intimacy with Jesus. And one person asked me this week, says, what do you mean by intimacy with Jesus? And I was like, where do I begin? Where do I start? And, uh, and I was in a coffee shop this week, and, and I was reading through this passage. And, and it, it, like, seriously, I was like, man, someone's going to come and ask me, are you okay, man? Like, because I was, like, crying, you know, runny nose and everything like that. Um, it's about a woman who, well, Jesus invited to, to a meal in a Pharisee's house. His name is Simon. It's in Luke chapter 7. And word gets around that Jesus was in this Pharisee's house. And a woman, uh, the New Living Translation says she was a promiscuous woman. There was only one woman. Uh, a woman that was promiscuous, there's only one way to be able to describe them. She was probably a prostitute um, or, you know, maybe a woman caught in adultery, but most possibly was a prostitute. And she gets news that Jesus is in this Pharisee's house and the audacity and the guts that she has to actually come to this house of a Pharisee. I like that true love, true love will make you walk with courage, isn't it? Even if you're a prostitute, you walk differently when you know you're loved, man. And she comes to this house and she sits by Jesus' feet and she begins to weep. Tears. Tears so much that she's like washing his feet with her tears. And then she undoes her hair and begins to wipe his feet. The Bible says that a woman's hair is her glory. Back then the culture, if a woman untied her hair in front of people, that was grounds for divorce. It was too personal. We talk about intimacy with Jesus. The Pharisee's house, prostitute. She begins to wipe his feet. And then when she's dried it, she begins to put the ointment, the perfume. The 
Pharisee, verse 39 in Luke chapter 7, when he saw what was happening, he said to himself, once again, coward, said to himself, if this man was a prophet, that is, if he really says that his origin is divine, if he knew, if he could see past the flesh, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is, who is touching him, for she is a sinner. If you are a lukewarm believer, unbeliever over here, I want you to be very excited that you're in church this morning. Because Jesus sees past your knowledge in the Bible. He sees past your actions. He sees past what you have done. And what he sees is where your heart is right now. Thank God that Jesus does not judge like religion does. Thank God that Jesus does not judge based on hypocritical actions or self-righteousness. He knows that this woman's destiny is pinging in the right direction. Her heart is in the right place. Her actions are not, but her heart is in the right place. And Jesus, in this passage, he, he turns to Simon, and he begins to say a parable. He says there were two men, and one guy had about $100,000 in loan, and one guy had about $10,000. Both of them were forgiven. And he says, Simon, do you tell me, which one do you think would be more excited? And he says, well, the $100,000, I think. And says, Simon, you're right. And then the Bible says, Jesus turns to the woman. So she's behind him. He turns to the woman while he's talking to Simon. And he says, Simon, those who have been forgiven much, they love much. What does it mean to be and to grow in intimacy with Christ? It's for us to recognize that we're forgiven much, and so we love much. It's for us to recognize that God was divine in origin, divine in his purpose, divine in his destiny, has all the right to condemn us to hell. He has all the right, even worse than the religious leaders, to say, these people don't really know what you've done. I know everything. Get out of here. How dare you even come into my presence? But he comes and he shows us love. And folks, listen to this. Unlike anything you will experience in this world. Some of you, you've been drug addicts, you've been in prison, and you know what it's like when you come out and your grandma is the only one who invites you in. Or that uncle or that one pastor was the only one who was your friend when nobody else wanted to be your friend. I'm so glad that you have that kind of love in your life, but Jesus' love is far superior. Maybe your grandma gave you a meal. Maybe your grandma gave you gas money. Maybe your grandma gave you a couch to sleep on. Jesus looks at your failure. He looks at your rap sheet, and he doesn't say, when you're out, I'll give you a couch to sleep on. He says, hey, you know what? Erase your name. I'm going to write my name on your rap sheet. You go live in my palace, in my glories, and I'm going to go to prison and take your sin on myself. You see, even if someone wanted to do that for you, they couldn't do that for you. Folks, that's the judgment of God. But the judgment will not make sense to you if you first don't see his origin, his purpose, and his destiny. Now, at this point, don't you just want to rejoice, say, thank you, Jesus? Don't you just want to, like, be like, Please, I want, to, I want to sit at your feet and can I please wash your feet and kiss it? And I just want to be, don't you feel that way? That's how we're supposed to feel when we see the amazing revelation of the validity of the claims of Jesus. But very quickly, it'll be wrong for me not to tell you the stupidity of those that reject the invitation and the claims of Jesus. Very, very, very quickly. I'm going to go through this very fast because I hope that there's nobody over here that has to experience the outcome of your stupidity. But if you do, let this be a warning to you, please. What's it going to be like when you live your life? Whatever it is you're going to go home and do, you're excited about. Whatever it is you've been watching Facebook Marketplace to see if it would pop up. Or, you know, you're watching your, your Bitcoins. You're watching your, you know, whatever it is you're investing in. And you're so excited. What's it going to be like? One day you're going to breathe your last and you're going to stand before his presence. And for him to not validate you. What's it going to be like? Is it going to be worth it? Please let it sink in. What is it going to be like? Is it really going to be worth it what you drove? Is it really going to be worth it what business you built? What kind of a CEO you were? What magazines wrote about you? How many followers you had? What's it really going to be like? Is it going to be worth it? When he says, sorry, your background check didn't go through. Turns out you chose your own destiny. Away from my presence. The outcome of the stupidity 
of ignoring the invitation that Jesus gives to you is so far worse than you can ever imagine. But Jesus puts it so lightly, so lovingly, so graciously, and I'm hoping that it would nudge you into eternity this morning. Verse 18, I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. This is what I'm talking about, man. You ever talk to those people, and all of a sudden, they throw something out of nowhere, and you're like, where did he go with that? Maybe you feel that way when I preach, right? You're like, how did he go from... And you go back and listen to it, right? How'd you, oh, what, what kind of a connection are you trying to make? I bet we my father was with me. You see, what Jesus is doing is, is very masterful. He, he's throwing his statements in to get them to ask questions so that he can actually teach them sound theology that their rabbis have not been teaching them. So when he says that, it's, I'm the one who bears witness about myself, and the father who sent me bears witness about me. The obvious question is, who, who's your daddy? Jerry Springer, who's the daddy? Jerry Springer, you know? Yeah. Verse 19. They said to him, sorry, that was my American education when I moved to America. They said, you got to watch this to understand America. I said, all right. No, kidding. Verse 19. Jesus said to him, therefore, where is your father? So they said to him, where is your father? Jesus set that statement up for them to ask this so that he can bring this to the, to the light. Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Wow. You know what's happening? He says, you are the one sitting here and doing the background check on everybody and saying valid, not valid, not valid, not valid. He's like, hey guys, you fail the check. You fail the test. You don't know me, neither do you know my father, man. You are trying to validate me when you have failed the test of validating yourself. You think you're in the light, but you're darkness. You think that you see, but you're blind. You think you're alive, but you're dead. And I wonder that how many Christians are there in our own neighborhoods, in our own homes, in our own churches, maybe even over here, who've lived all their life thinking that, I see, I'm alive, but you've not really examined the claims of Jesus and surrendered and rejoiced over it and received it for yourself and found life and truth. But you've been walking in self-righteousness, on hypocrisy, and you're getting tired of it. And this morning, Jesus is saying, come. All are weary, come. I'm not judging you based on your actions, but I'm looking at your destiny, man. Where do you want to be? And if you say that you want to be with me for eternity, then that's got to be love for me now, isn't it? Isn't it? And if my wife wanted to marry me, I would imagine that she'd want to hang out with me for the rest of her life, right? Not be like, okay, I marry you now. Okay, fine. Hey, I've got a house for you in the North End because you'd fit in over there with your dreads and everything, and I'm going to live in Eagle. Wouldn't make sense, right? She'd want to be with me. And if you say that you want to spend eternity with Jesus, then you've got to have love for him. And so the question that I want to close with is, how's your love for Jesus? Now, he's, he showed himself, say, hey, you can, you can check everything, all my claims. But when he begins to check the pulse of your affection, is it a pulse or is it dead? Are you growing in intimacy with Jesus? And is the claims of his origin, purpose, and destiny yours also? And when you think of his judgment, does it make you jump for joy? Or as the apostles warn us, does it make you want to hide your face in shame? And if it makes you want to hide your face in shame, today is a good day for you to look to him. The Bible says those who look to him will never be put to shame. Their faces will be radiant. Wouldn't we want that? Would you please stand? Let's pray real close. Thank you, Lord, for this day that we skip an hour of sleep. But by the grace and mercy of God, we've gained eternity. <laughs> it's, it's so worth it to skip an hour of sleep to have the assurance of knowing our eternal destiny. We thank you, God, that you're the only one who can chop the head of the giant with his own sword. You're the only one who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than we can ask or imagine for your glory in your church. And Father, that's what I ask for this morning for your church, that your glory will be so evident in this place, so evident in our lives, that even our homes will be transformed, our workplaces will be transformed, our neighborhoods will be transformed, that everything that concerns us will be transformed by your glory. Father, I thank you that our works do not determine where we go. We th I thank you so much for that, God. 
Thank you that you don't judge us based on what we've done and what we don't do, but you really look at what we believe. The Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So this morning, church, I beg you, put your faith in Jesus. Believe what he's done for you. Believe that his death on the cross was for you. Believe that when he says it's, you're forgiven, his words are true, that you are forgiven. And now, let your actions prove that you're in love with Jesus. Father, I pray that you'd create a hunger for your word in us today. Create a hunger for your presence in us today. That this week, we will watch the temptation of sin diminish and grow weaker and weaker and weaker. And Father, I pray for healing in our bodies too. Healing in our bodies that causes us to, to doubt your supernatural claims. Father, I pray for healing in bodies that, that need that healing, Lord. Sicknesses in our bodies that is there for reasons that we don't know. Doctors don't know. So stretch out your powerful nail-scarred hands and touch the bodies that need healing. I pray for those watching at home that need this healing, Father. Father, I pray for healing of mind and heart. For those who are struggling with depression, do not know where it comes from. Depression that comes because of sin. Depression that comes because of just hardened hearts. I pray that today that there will be a breakthrough, O oh Lord. That today that the darkness will be removed. That that stone will be rolled away. And that your child that you have created with an eternal destiny will be able to walk in the light with joy. <laughs> God, multiply the anointing that you've called us with, Lord. Multiply your anointing today, Lord. Multiply it. Multiply it. We thank you, Father. God, I thank you for every single person that's in this room over here that's created by your beautiful, beautiful hands with a purpose. Thank you for life that you've given us. God, I pray that every single day that we live this week, we will expect to see your glory and that we would work towards pleasing you and that we will watch your hand in everything that we do. God, continue to verify the awesome God that you are in every area of our life. We thank you, God, for today. We thank you for this time. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the power of the Holy Spirit anoint each and every one of you from head to toe in everything that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys.